OK, has everyone been let in now, Leslie? Yeah, probably be some more as we go. OK, well, uh, good evening and welcome to everyone who's attending the meeting tonight. Um, I just do the introductions to start with. So um, there's two councillors who will be chairing the meeting. There's my colleague, Councillor Councillor Ewan Mackey, who you can probably see on the screen, and myself, David Pears. So welcome to you all. In the meeting tonight, we've got officers talking to us about a COVID update. So that's Paul Campbell. We've got uh, Mark Croxford from Environmental Health talking to us about travellers and COVID prosecutions maybe. We've got Leslie Williams from Perry Bar Depot that deals with everything to do with waste management and street cleansing and those types of things. Um, we've got Carl from Highways, who's the Highways Engineer for Sutton. And then we've got Chris Richard and maybe Lucy coming from Kia, who look after fixing the roads and the potholes and things like that. And then we've got Heather from the police, um, who here to help us as well. And then last but not least, um, we've got Mark Dixon rep is an officer from the Sutton um, Town uh, Council to give us an update on what Sutton Town Council has been up to and maybe to answer a few uh, questions as well. So welcome all. Uh, and this need to advise you that this meeting is in public and a recording will be available for public future record and that will be on YouTube and I think available in the next five working days, if that's right, Leslie, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. OK, so um, that brings us on to item number three. So, Paul, would you like to share with us an update on the current COVID situation, please? Thank you, Councillor. So it's an update on the current situation for Birmingham. Um, some data around the two wards that are here um where we have that data at that level and then just some reminders around some of the the current messaging um and where you can go to get tests etc so i'm going to try and be brief because i'm very aware that you've just detailed a very full agenda so i'll try and keep it very brief and allow some time for q a so um on the on a birmingham level um, up until the 25th of June, the week on week data had increased quite dramatically, uh, around a 45% increase in the, the weekly uh, case rate. So we've moved from somewhere in the region of 1500 to around 2000 cases. Um, so quite a steep uptake. Um, if we compare that to sort of other local authorities uh, across the West Midlands, we are, I think we're actually the top, no, sorry, we're the second out of the uh, out of all the local authorities within the West Midlands. Uh, however, if we compare ourselves to the core cities across the uh, across the rest of the nation, we're actually not doing too badly if we compare against those pictures. I think we're seventh out of eighth in terms of um, so the seventh second lowest case rate out of the eight core cities. So it looks a little bit better on that in terms of the national picture as opposed to the regional. Um, we're seeing uh, increased case rates across most age groups, uh, apart from 6 to 79, where that's dropped slightly. Uh, largest increase in the youngest age groups, 0 to 19, although I imagine some of that will be driven by the fact that we haven't started to roll out vaccines for those under the age of 18 yet. Um, most, there's been a decrease in Asian and mixed and other ethnic groups uh, and increases in the black and white ethnic groups. Largest increase seen in the white group, uh, which raised the uh, thirty eight percent over the two week period. In terms of the local data, Sutton Trinity um, had twenty two reported cases during the last week of reporting. Um, and in terms of a case rate, that's broadly comparable to the average across Birmingham. Um, roughly uh, is actually forty eight out of sixty nine. Um, so it's a little bit lower. Uh, and close to the bottom third in terms of sort of the, the actual case rates coming through. So there's a little bit of a difference between the two areas. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, that's the information update. And then I just wanted to talk through sort of the current guidance, which is around testing is now the main sort of first line of defence. Uh, we're encouraging everyone to get an LFT test twice a week. Uh, you can pick them up at pharmacies. You can get them at some supermarkets. They'll advertise if they've got them. And you can order them online and I'll share the link for that in the chat after I finish speaking. 
Um, they take two working days to arrive from the time you order them. I ordered some the other day. They turned up within 24 hours. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty snappy service. Um, whether you have symptoms or not, please do those tests twice a week. And if it then transpires that you have symptoms, go into the, the isolation guidance. And I'll just to interrupt you there. And that's even yes. if you've had the, both the jabs. Yes, yes. So the jabs aren't, uh, well, no vaccination is 100% effective. Um, I think after the first jab, I've got some notes, bear with me. After the first jab, uh, you're around 60, 70% protected. After your second, it's in the high 90s is the current estimates. So no, no vaccine is 100% fail safe. Um, so please do, yes, keep testing because you could be carrying without symptoms and, and unfortunately become a transmitter. If, however, you do have symptoms, then we'd recommend the, the second variety of tests, which is the PCR tests. Uh, and you can book them online. You can call 119 or you can go to the testing sites. And again, I've got links for the testing sites so you can find your local ones or your closest ones after, after I've uh, gone off the call. Um, if you are booking those results, if you are booking those, continue to isolate until your tests come back and your household members have to isolate as well. That's on the symptomatic test, sorry. Uh, if you if you get a negative test back, then you can just go straight back to your normal activities and that's absolutely fine. Um, if you test positive, then you carry on the isolation period for 10 days from the onset of symptoms. In terms of vaccinations uh, within the two wards, within uh, with the two certain wards, um, it's actually looking really good in the older age groups, uh, over 90% for those age 70 plus. So really, really good numbers. You know, one in 10 are, are, are not getting the vaccine, but nine out of 10, I think is a pretty, pretty good rate. Unfortunately, it drops as low as around 36% if we're looking at all 18, 18 plus population. Now, I'd hope to see those go up as the as you know, the availability for 18 plus has only been in for a week or two, I think. So I'd expect to see those numbers go up in the coming months. Um, but if people could encourage others to take the vaccine, especially in those younger age groups, we'd really appreciate it. Um, everyone's encouraged to have their vaccination. Um, if you've been offered a vaccination and you've changed your mind, that's absolutely fine. Get in touch with your GP, get in touch with uh, any of the uh, 119, any of the sort of delivery mechanisms. There's walk-in centres. Again, I'll give the links when I've, when I've stopped uh, talking through. Um, and yeah, please do just book in your vaccinations if, if, if you haven't already or if you've decided or changed your mind about not wanting one previously. Uh, and then I just wanted to touch briefly on the restrictions. Um, so at the moment, the restrictions, we didn't go out, come out of full lockdown um, in the middle of June as initially proposed. Uh, I believe there will be another review of restric restrictions on the 19th of July. Um, and we, we don't get advance warning of that, so I can't, I can't sort of comment as to what may or may not happen at that point. Um, but as it currently stands, we're broadly on rule of six indoors or two households. So that would be um, six people from separate households can meet or two, two households of any number of people can meet indoors. And in terms of outdoor groups, it's 30 people. Um, you can stay overnight at friends' houses, again, with the same sort of caveats of six people or two households mixing. Uh, continue to work from home where you can. Um, a lot of places are now open in terms of retail and personal care uh, and sort of the hospitality sector they've reopened. But again, subject to those same rules of please, you know, no more than six or no more than two households uh, indoors. Um, overseas travel is still on a red, amber, green mechanism, so there may be needs need to isolate. I know a lot of us are thinking about summer holidays now, potentially, um, but there is still that need to check your destination, check their rules and also check the, the government website for our rules about what you'd need to do when you're re-entering the country and sort of then plan, plan around that appropriately. A word of caution that they do seem to change quite regularly. So I would I would just say, you know, um, do view the guidelines, but also, you know, treat them with caution that you may, they may change while you're abroad and, and plan accordingly. Um, currently, there's no additional uh, mechanisms around those who are extremely vulnerable, such as shielding that we had before. That's now not part of the guidance. However, we do suggest that you exercise additional caution and potentially shop at quieter hours, potentially go to you know, um, hospitality sector during the quieter times out, uh, within work hours, potentially when a lot of other people wouldn't be attending. That was everything I wanted to cover. Hopefully I haven't gabbled through that too quickly, but I'm more than willing to 
answer questions or take them away if I'm not able to answer them today. OK, thank you. Um, I can see you in Scott, and I've just got a quick one, then I'm going to bring you in. I've seen some numbers today that suggest Rectory Park 302 and Sutton North 223. What are those issues in, in, in Sutton at the moment? Is it just, as you've said, the younger age group, or is there something more to it? What were those two? Sorry, Rectory Park and... Rectory Park says 302 and Sutton North 223. And that's from the news feed today. Um, I haven't been given access to the full okay. set of data across all of the wards. I was just given a sort of an information brief. Okay. Do you want those... to come back to me later? That's fine then. Um, Absolutely fine. I you, can get those. You've got a question? Yeah, I've got um, three, if that's all right. I mean, well, first one's a bit of a statement, really, that, you know, I think that I agree um, or certainly follow through, you know, with the schools, etc. Just had to do a lateral flow test for my uh, son this evening because, you know, you could do that. And I find that I'd have a tendency to um, uh, to do it at the same time myself because I went out recently to use swipe when you go into a restaurant. And of course, you come into contact with other people. And I got the dreaded ping and had to um, had to um, self isolate. Even though I've been double jabbed. I appreciate that may change in the future. But, um, you know, so you're going to get out and about. So I understand uh, sort of the sort of uh, endorse, shall we say, the, the lateral flow bit. But the two questions I was going to ask, the first one was, um, I think I remember in the summer last year, I think it was the beginning of one of the other, uh, one of the sort of newer waves that similar, like I was saying there, you know, you, the younger people have a tendency to sort of go out more and socialise because, you know, I think we, we all did that when we were younger, didn't we? So I think we noticed that there were beginnings of this about this time last year, it was the 20 year old, that 18 to 22 year old bracket, suddenly saw a big uptake there in the sort of, um, in catching of COVID. Then there was like the 40 year old, so I suppose go and see mum and dad or something like that it picked up then and then after that about two weeks after that you suddenly saw it pick up in the 70 or 80 year old group and that's of course when hospital admissions and sort of fatalities start to rise so the question the first question was going to be are we seeing that sort of um cycle again or is this one slightly different and the other one is to say is what what could you say because i've got sort of you know sort of some a uh, couple of children who one of which would not call herself that young these days but you know sort of how um you know, there's there's a lot of side effects that mentioned that young people, especially sort of my daughter can list off a load of um, uh, sort of side effects that are said to happen to do with the jab. And obviously, COVID's a bit of an infection of the young and disease of the old. But of course, it's important that we get everyone jabbed. Just wondering if you could say anything that could reassure the younger sort of generations that, you know, that it is safe to have the jab if, uh, as, as it is, so to speak. Sorry, uh, over to you now. I've spoken a lot there. No, no, that no, that's, they're both really good questions, and and um, I'm glad to hear you're getting LFT tests regularly because that mm. that really does help you know, contain the the case rates and the infection rate. Um, so in terms of what happened in the summer of 2020, um, I'm not sure on the fatality rates, but it's a little bit of a yes and no, I would think. So I think there's potential, and we're seeing it play out in some of the numbers I spoke about, that the case rates could go up. However, what the vaccine does is protect against those real sort of strong um, reactions. Um, and this is all dependent on variants and how they start to interact with the, the vaccine and whether they invalidate the vaccine protection and so forth. So I'm speaking with a lot of caveats, um, but my my personal view uh, would be that I, I would hope if we don't see uh, variations coming in, then the while we may see an increase in case rate, hopefully we won't see that translated into hospital uh, hospitalizations and fatality. That That would be, that would be my view of the data, but I say that comes with a lot, a lot of caveats. Yeah. Um, we don't fully understand this illness or this disease still. Um, and yeah, th that's kind of where we are. Um, in terms of side effects, um, I was actually on a call the other week and listening to one of our assistant directors doing a, a detailed Q&A. Um, and the effect, the side effects are effectively a sign that the, it is working. That's what it's meant to do, is produce that immune response within your body. And if your body reacts, and some people, I mean, I personally, my first vaccine, I reacted really, really badly. Um, I, I was out of action for probably three or four days. Um, however, yeah, that's a sign that it worked, that it that I've actually got the immunity, that my system reacted and fought it off. Um, 
and my my per again this is very much a personal view of mine i think even though i had very harsh adverse side effects um i think i would prefer that to covid would be my, you know my my real honest answer on that um but talking about very young people i think the the evidence is still not there on under 18s um, and that that we're waiting for that to play through in the evidence and the government government advice. So that's why we're at 18 plus at the moment. So depending on what you mean by young people and, and side effects yeah. and transmission depends on what advice I would give. If you're under 18, I wouldn't wouldn't recommend vaccines as yet because the science isn't there. Over 18, please get vaccinated. Yes, you may have side effects. Um, severe side effects are very uncommon. Um, I know, you know, the, there's a lot of fake news out there about some of the side effects and I, I, I probably can't address every one of those myths today. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, the side effects are a, a signal that your body is reacting in the way that it should and creating the immune effects that we want it to create. No, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, for myself, my first jab didn't really notice anything. Funny enough, even though I had the AstraZeneca, it was my second jab. That, that one there, I, I felt, um, you know, I felt tired if I walked around a bit. You know, sort of my body told me that it was having to put a shift in more than normal. But as you say, after about three days, um, you know, you're back to normal again aren't you? and you feel fine. And, and uh, you know, you just don't want to be in that situation where you someone's saying they're going to intubate you. And uh, do you want to make your last call home kind of thing? You know what I mean? So, yeah, on that basis, happily take the job. Thank, thanks very much for those answers. Um, no, no, thank, you, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can't see any more hands up. Is that right, Leslie? No, there's no more hands up, Councillor Pears. OK, thank you. Well, thank you, Paul, very much for that update and for Thanks answering all those all. questions. And if you can come back to me later on with what you can find on those numbers, that'd be very helpful. Of course. Thank of course. you. Thank thank you. Thank you Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Um, you take care. Bye-bye. Cheers, next, Paul. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Next item is environmental health. Have we got Mark on the... Yes, I think I can see Mark there on the on the on those present. Um, Mark, um, thanks for coming into the meeting. Um, would you be able to sort of share with us a, an update? It's a couple of topical areas for us. One is obviously uh, the situation that we've had around certain coal field over the last few weeks with the um, travellers. Um, so, from your perspective, um, what sort of stage are are we at and have we got any positive news on the uh, capacity issue at the site in the city? And um, the other area I was be interested to have an update on, because it's not wide, widely commented, I suppose, um, is and I think you were responsible for any prosecutions that might be taken as a result of people breaching the COVID rules. So um, if there's anything relevant you want to share with us on that, I think that'd be quite helpful. Thank you. So if, we, if it's all right with you, councillor, we'll take the um, the GRT community first and then we'll move forward to the um, the legislation after we've had, had any questions on that. Thank um, you. We've had quite a, a, a difficult summary, I suppose, or a difficult year in that um, due to the lockdown, um, the the government really required everybody to, to stay at home. Um, and that meant that where um, there were people on the move in the in the Gypsy Romy Traveller community, the GRT community, um, local authorities were asked to tolerate um, any encampments and not to keep them moving around because of the the the, the backdrop to um, the spread of COVID. Um, that's that's meant that the transit site that we've got in Birmingham has been heavily used, and that's the one down at Proctor Street in Nature's. Um And that's also we've also got an issue on that site with one family being on there particularly for a long period of time. I'm looking to stay on the site, which is coming to um, an end in, in July. I don't propose to go into all the details for that, but it was right and proper, but that, that is that is coming to an end um, uh, very shortly. And then the site can be um, closed and repaired and then it will be reopened. Um, coming back to the where we were with government advice up until very recently, the government advice was that um, all unauthorised encampments had to be tolerated um, and that the local authority could move them to better accommodation, i.e. the transit site. But by and large, we didn't see much in the way of movement or people coming into Birmingham. Um, that's really changed in the last um, three months. Um, I think Bill and Dave have been very busy um, in and around your your wards, um, and 
to a large extent, working with the police, we've been moving the people onto the transit site um, and advising people that if the site is full, it doesn't give them an excuse to go into the park. And if they continue to use the park, then we'll take other legal action to stop them coming to Birmingham and using the parks. Um, where we are at the moment, yep, we I think we've moved the last ones out of Pipe Hayes the other week. I don't think you've got any more in, in Sutton. Um, reason that people come to Birmingham think it's probably economic. Um, so it, there will always be a demand. We're working with planning department and housing department about developing other sites. So currently the one in Proctor Street um, is available for 15 caravans, although it did take 16. Bit worried when you when you when you overfill it um, because there's an issue around fire separation for the vehicles. Um, the other site that we've got is Aston Brook Street. Um, that was a small site which is which will have um, four or five pitches on it and working very hard to bring that forward now. Um, and then we're pushing with um, our colleagues in planning and housing to see whether there is any other sites because the Birmingham Development Plan um, has identified a need for the city for 30 pitches for, for transit use and excludes any settled settled pitches. But the transit use, which is what really affects um, the local community, we're looking for somewhere in the region of 30 pitches in total. Um, you're probably aware that the government put out a consultation paper um, for increased powers for local authorities and police. Um, I've reported back to the Licensed Public Protection Committee that although the police received some additional powers, the local authority didn't receive any, any additional powers at all under that consultation. Um, the one specific power that we were looking for, and I think the police were looking for, this, for the same power as well, was that where you've got adjacent local authorities with transit sites, currently under the section 6162 legislation, you can't direct somebody outside of your area. So you can't direct them out of the borough, um, which means that um, we've got adjacent sites in Samwell, for instance, Samwell, obviously we're adjacent to them. We can't direct them or the police can't direct them to an adjacent site. And I think that was a wee bit disappointing, to be honest. Um, I think if if local authorities are bringing on the transit sites and we're trying to get them across the seven metropolitan authorities in the West Midlands, um, it would be really helpful if we could um, guide people to a, a site where there is water, toilets, health care, um, you know, the health care workers and the, the school workers can actually go down and support the families as well. I think the other big change that's occurred is you're probably aware that we had, um, I think it was nine injunctions across the city. Those in, those injunctions basically all started with the same and they affected everybody who wanted um, to reside in a park and that, that, that meant they were prohibited from um, residing in the park and all of the injunctions started to persons unknown. So that meant anybody who went into those parks would be served with a copy of the injunction. If they then failed to leave, they could be prosecuted and indeed arrested and brought before the judge. In the last, um, I think it's 10 months, um, there's been a, a um, High Court review of all of these injunctions right across the country. And the decision by the High Courts is that the um, persons unknown injunctions can no longer be used. So we can serve it on a person by name, and we can take action about individuals, but no longer can we protect a park by serving a, uh, having a, a notice in place that says persons unknown must not reside on this park. Um, again, it's a change in the legislation and it's hampered us a little bit, um, but if there are sufficient levels of antisocial behaviour, then we will look to injunct, injunct um, um, anybody with either by name or indeed by photograph, because you can do both as I've, I've subsequently learned. So that's really a canter through where we are with the legislation. I don't know if it's answered your questions, but um, okay. if, if you want to take questions uh, on that. Thank you. I think that summarised the position as I understood it. I know we've got Heather Jones on uh, in attendance. Before we open up questions, Heather, is there anything you want to add to what Mark's just shared with us? Well, I think you might have just gone back on to mute there. Heather, um, couldn't. Um, is there anything you want to add um, to what Mark's just said before we take questions? <sighs> I think you're on mute, Heather. Okay. Yeah, 
she's, well, she's muting and then it's automatically... So you're free now, you're there? Oh, you're back on. Okay. Mm. I, uh, okay, we'll have to, have to see if we can... Uh, Leslie, can you can you unmute? Because I think sometimes the admin can unmute someone. Or is it only, can they only mute? Maybe. Don't know. I'm trying to do it. <laughs> Just keep okay. jumping back. Okay, we'll we'll carry on because we'll see what what happens and if if it, if we get Heather working, just let us know. Um, so, are there, are there any questions from anyone? I can't see if there's any. Hands well, I've up. got just one there, David. If I could, um, I was quite in, I was quite quite interested to. Obviously, we were talking about the persons unknown. There was that something that came out of the Anderton Park process because I noticed that. There, I think they took an injunction out against per per persons unknown, and I think, I, if I remember rightly, there was some some sort of kickback about that, about injuncting against sort of the whole population, so to speak. Um, the, the simple answer is no, as far as I'm aware. That the the, the answer is no. Um, what um, my understanding is um, occurred is that a local authority in London, um, can't quite remember which one, and I don't want to um, give the wrong one, um, decided that it was going to take a person's unknown injunction for the whole of the borough. Now, bearing in mind it's a protected characteristic and that there's a right to, a right to this lifestyle, um, from where I was sitting, that was absolutely fatal um to the to the to, to to the strategy we were using which was if there had been severe antisocial behavior we would protect the park and the residents around that park as a result of that antisocial behavior and that seemed to be working quite well um the judge quite correctly in my opinion came down and this is what the advice from from the barristers that we were using came down and said you haven't got the right to ban somebody from your 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 area so it was it was the fact that um, a London borough tried to ban people from the whole of the borough that then caused the judge to review all of the um, injunctions that had this on it. He's he's done that review. I understand that those who were um, very deeply involved in the court cases and were appointing QCs etc to fight the court cases, they're now taking an appeal against the decision. The bit that we are concerned about, and we've had advice from our um, specialist bar barrister, is that um, particularly on the car cruising, so the, the vehicles moving, um, and what he's saying, and I can't remember the Latin phrase, you'll have to, you have to mm. forgive me, it's not one I'd ever come across before, but he's saying where there is a real outcome that could cause the death of somebody, then it would be proportional to carry on with the person's unknown. So his argument is the car cruising um, injunctions will stand and he's he's acting on behalf of the city led um, in conjunction with Pam Powers from the antisocial behaviour teams. Um, we're, we're leading to try and clarify that that particular one but there, there is a special phrase in law and, and that's what he's exercising for us. Um, I think that we might get some of the power back um, but I, I do I do think that lo local authorities who are trying to ban um, the GRT community from their area. Um, yeah, that led us to where we are today. Brilliant. Th thanks for that. Great answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other questions on, on that subject before uh, we ask Mark to go on to the next item part? No? Um, Mark, I just wanted to ask one because it's been so frustrating seeing the travellers moving back from sites and then coming back again and then leaving litter and defecating in people's um, garden gate doorways and places like that. Is there any other remedy open to us to um, make it less attractive for people to come to these sites to park up their caravans for a few days? Um, I think, I mean, we've tried literally lots and lots and lots of different different tacks and I know sites have been protected against um, incursions but given that um, a number of the of the of the community are there for landscaping driveways etc they've got heavy plant and equipment um, there's very little that I've come across that actually prevents 
um, people getting onto the site. Um, so even, you know, which is unsightly, the trenching, of, you know, we've come across sites which have been filled in so that the vehicles can, can, can get across. Um, the, the real solution is to have, and I actually believe that we're all local authorities should have it, and I'm sure it was the case in the 80s when I was young, um, that all, site, all, all councils used to have to have a transit site. Now, I understand that if you're in mid Wales and you've never seen anybody come to your site, then it, it's a waste of money having to maintain maintain it and we used to have of course Tameside Drive which was an operational transit site um, yeah. and, uh, and I think um, if all of the local authorities working together can have these transit sites and we can direct them across the boundaries then to be honest with you that's the solution and um, the, the section 62 power means that once you're directed as a site the only place you may stay for three months is the site if you go on to any other land in the local authority, whether that's in Sutton or right down in Longbridge, then that is an offence. You're directed to stay in the site, so you have two choices. You can go to the site or you can go to another area, but you can't go on to another area in Birmingham. OK, thank you. I can't I can't see any more questions, though. Do you want to just briefly tell us what's happened about any prosecutions as a result of people doing things they shouldn't on COVID in our, in our town, or is it all sort of... Quite so the working no, well. I, I mean, to be fair, up in, in in Sutton, it's it's not too bad at all. Um, the the legislation um, is is emergency powers that that have come through from government. The way in which um, the legislation's been drafted, it comes under two acts. Some of it comes under the Health and Safety Work Act, and that's where you hear people talking about risk assessments and business doing risk assessments. The other act that it comes under is the Public Health Act, uh, control of diseases. Um, that is a power that not many people knew that environmental had. Um, so environmental health have had that power for many years and I think it came as a bit of a surprise to lots of people that we could do lots of horrible things to people in controlling um, the spread of the disease and that in, and it's from those that things like the isolations are based. Um, the way in which the legislation has been drafted by government is by and large the police and the local authority um, get all of the delegated powers except for the police have the powers that deals with the individual. So if it's about wearing a face mask then that would be a police mask, uh, police power because it's about the individual. If it's about the business you shouldn't trade, you haven't got risk assessments, you have, you've got tables and chairs too close and all of that sort of thing um, then that's dealt with by um, the local authority. By and large, that's what we've come to an agreement with in the police, and it's worked really well over the last sort of um, 18 months. Um, and really pleased with the, the sort of working um, relationship we've had, um, mainly through the licensing team as a lead, but through um, Chief Inspector, Chief Superintendent Steve Graham. It's been a really successful partnership. Um, the other massive difference that we have is that by and large with the local authority powers is we would serve a notice and it's non-compliance with the notice or the request that then leads to an offence. So when we when we went into the last lockdown, a lot of our work was going out to businesses and telling them you have to close under this this lockdown and they then closed. What was annoying was we had to go and tell them you have to close and they closed. We we can't just serve a notice because they were open. And that's where the COVID marshals and the, the additional enforcement officers that Justin paid for came into the fore. And we were going around lots of the, the, the high risk wards. Um, in total, we did a calculation. Um, we, we've issued um, quite a lot of fixed penalty tickets. So there have been some breaches and I think we're around about um, 70 tickets in total. That's from a presentation I did a little while ago. The police are significantly higher because they could do individuals, so individual breaches. If they turned up to a house and there were 20 people in there, technically they could give all of them a ticket without any form of warning. And that's really the difference. We have a couple of prosecutions that are lined up. Um, they will be going forward, um, but I can't talk about them as individual cases okay. at the moment. Okay, thank you. It, Ewan, you've got a question. I can see your hand. Yeah, I mean, how how sort of much cooperation have you received? I think there was a well-known, um, I don't know if the word is case or incident, uh, I think it was a hairdresser somewhere in Yorkshire who was quoting the Magna Carta, and I think she opened 
she opened about 15 times or something and every time she got an injunction she just carried on opening and I'm not quite sure how that one ended up but have, have you had had many repeat offenders or has it just been people who generally are just ignorant of what the situation was and as soon as they're brought up to speed with it sort of comply because obviously sort of the national need in the middle of a pandemic you know um the the ones that we had most difficulty with at the beginning um was some of the um wedding centers etc um so we ended up with some closure notices on those um the police were issuing the um ten thousand pound fpns um that concentrated the mind um and that and that seemed to work um a number of the places that we went to um just just speaking to them actually succeeded so we were, when we went back with the prohibition notice they were closed and that was particularly around car washes for the second time around it was it was weird um the one we have at the moment as you're aware in under the step three and the extension of step three um nightclubs are still closed show us shishi bars and some other places um the shishi bars particularly we're having a few difficulties with at the moment um and and that's where a lot of the enforcement action is actually concentrated at the moment the problem with the shisha is it's a it's a water pipe and people share the pipe so i will i will smoke from the pipe and then i will pass it to somebody else and they'll pass it to a th third fourth and fifth so obviously that's going around and it's touching your mouth and the spittles on it so that's a very quick way to spread it um although they're given a um um, I don't know, you describe it, a straw or something to go in the end, so you've got a personal use. By and large, people do not use those. So shisha bars are supposed to be closed, and we are experiencing a lot of pushback on that. Um, with reali the reality of the situation is the government are pushing very hard on um, relaxing it on the 21st of July. So I think it's going to be proportionate to take enforcement action, but no, no more stringent action than that at the moment. Yeah, you mentioned nightclubs. It was surreal. The weekend I was invited by one of the bids and they were showing me everything that they were doing to make everything safe and took me into one of the nightclubs that obviously has reopened as a bar. So it's most surreal to see this nightclub with a load of socially distant tables there. You know, it sort of take a had to take a bit of a second look at it. But there was people there enjoying themselves sort of legally and responsibly. So um, I, I think well done for them for being... Uh, being able to adapt to the situation but i think everyone Absolutely. would like it yeah, yeah and i think everyone would like everyone to get back to a more normal way when it's safe to do so i think yeah I mean, the officers have been giving a lot of advice on what they can do to be compliant. We've been ranking them as red, amber and green when we've been doing the the, the inspections. So red ones were having to go back. The amber ones is because it's a lot, a lot less and it's very much around guidance. And please, can you think of this? And it would be better if you do this. We've also been trying to um, share learning. So if place A is doing a really good job, but we tell you place B and C and D, you want to have a look at what they're doing. It's really good. Um, and that's been a really positive thing. Um, I feel very, very much for the businesses um but i think as our previous one um, um presenter said um vaccinations is is the way um and it, and it really is about encouraging people um to do to, you know to take it up and that is ultimately the way we're going to get out of this Thanks, okay. thank you thank you very much i can't see any questions leslie and if you've got any i can't see um so thank you very much mark for all of what you and your team do I know you all work long hours, weekends and all times of night and day going to sort things out to make it safe for us all. So, so thank you very much. Indeed. Thanks for listening. Yeah, if, okay. if I could second that, because the number of times I get incidences to ask and sometimes you go on there within 24 hours and give them the advice required and I get a nice email back from a resident to say, well, this is better now. So no, thanks very much for your assistance for that. Brilliant. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Number five, then it's uh, Leslie. Uh, um, thanks, thanks for waiting there patiently. I think in, in in the wings, and I think there might be one or two residents who might have one or two questions for you there. So, is there a, is there anything that you want to share with us before uh, we open up? Um, just, I think we want to uh, so yeah, Good evening, folks. Everyone, thanks for the invite, Council. Um, I just wanted to share that when we last met, we were taking some steps to get some extra staff in. We've got some new budgets coming into the service, uh, and that looks more graffiti crews. So, um, Perry Bar, who services your area, will have a, their own bespoke graffiti crew, so they can act uh, quite quickly there as they. Um, we've also got some crews that will be doing some dumping work, so lots of the fly tipping around Perry Bar in the area. Again, they've got their own bespoke crew. 
their service. Um, they're up and running as we speak. Uh, I'm quite pleased to say that both Rockley and um, Trinity are quite low with dumping issues, um, but we are taking some big steps and strides now to identify the prevalent spaces. Um, I think I may have said in our last meeting that uh, our waste enforcement colleagues, they are recruiting. Uh, I think they're just about in place now. And some of that recruitment is going to be given bespoke to waste management to deal with some of these issues across the wards. Um, obviously, Intel is key to all this. And if people see things, um, we'd like to uh, get, 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 uh, get a note of that from somebody. But having said that, if we've got a regular spot where we can't catch people, we're going to be taking some active uh, um, exercises to catch them. Uh, and that being in, in the form of cameras that's coming along with this um, this new uh, environment support we've got. Um, we've also, uh, and I don't know if I'm there to tell you because it's just in the wings as we speak, we've also gained some short term money to look at uh, where we've got, say, a main street and you've got some shops and there's some flats above the shops and we're getting sex put out. Um, we do understand that some of these flats don't have the facility for uh, wheel bins or any any other idea uh, to keep their waste. So we'll be looking to initially doing a regular collection of these sacks. Uh, and it might be that, you know, if it's a, a two bedroom flat and there's four or five people, which is more likely to, to be the case these days, as the waste comes out, we want to try and tackle that. And then working hand in hand to try and look to identify if they need wheel bins, if we can give them wheel bins even, um, so we can solve the problem and get them on a, a good clean system. So that will identify some of our main roads where we've got a bit of blight where sacks are coming out. Uh, and it might be that it's a, um, a, you know, just a couple of free shops on a corner and some flats above and we've got the same issues. We're looking to tackle that and get the right stuff in place. So a short term bit of money for that uh, will help us uh, engage with people and to get them put. Put uh, on the system as they need to be. Um, when I spoke last time we met, uh, I advised that we'd had a number of new fleeting, so lots of our, um, our recycling trucks have been replaced. Um, lots of our container type vehicles have been replaced. Replaced, sorry. And since the last meeting, we've took delivery of another, I think it's about 17 trucks, and these are predominantly the refuse collection style trucks. Um, we've made a slight change in these ones in that we've bought narrow, narrow bodied ones. So they look the same to the human eye, but they're not quite as wide. Um, obviously, we all understand Birmingham's getting more and more congested, uh, into the clean air zone, I guess. Uh, but uh, these trucks are slightly narrower. Um, they do have a smaller payload, but we've worked all that through. But it helps us to get into some of these tight places. And we can see now that. Um, our miscollections or our failing to get into roads is reducing quite significantly as a result of that. Um, but as a whole, both wards are performing quite well for miscollections and for um, and for uh, bulk, uh, dump waste or bulk, yeah, dump bulky waste mm -hmm. on the streets. Um, I have no other updates other than that, but uh, if we've got some questions, I'm quite happy to answer them. Thank you. I know, there's, I know there's some questions. I'm, I'm aware of two. Um, I think there's a la there's a lady um, called Margaret on the meeting. Margaret, have you got a question for Les? Because um, I know that there's a lot of hard work that's been done by Sutton Coal for Litter Action Group. And I don't know, Margaret, if you've got a question for Les on, on yeah. Maybe Island Road. I have, actually. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me to the meeting. And I just start with saying, Les, that your your guys are doing a, a brilliant job job uh, collecting all the waste every week and the recycling and you know fair play to them. However, um, Sutton Coalfield Litter Action Group was founded in January, and I've adopted Ryland Road as my road to keep clean. So I'm um, out there a couple of times a week collecting lots of litter, um, which is fine. However, my question is around the fact that at the bus stop towards the north, don't know, don't know what direction it is, uh, the top of Ryland Road, um, there is an extreme amount of litter, which I pick up, and allegedly your guys pick up, 
where there used to be a, a little bin which disappeared about five years ago. No consultation, just just was taken away. So my question is, why can't I have a litter bin at the bus stop so that at least some people might put some litter in the bin? Yeah, well, Thank thanks you, Margaret. for that, Margaret. Um, obviously, it's 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 new. If it's been missing five years, you appreciate it's news to me. If if we got an area that you regularly used by people, uh, and like as bus stops are, um, I will get that in, have it looked at, have it inspected, and see if we can do something. Um, if we can install another bin there, if that's what needs to happen. Yeah, uh, because the why I, I had less was that there was no litter on Ryland Road. Well, that's because I'm picking it up. Yeah, I, I so, think we can put, yeah. I, let me look at it. I mean, it shouldn't be too much of a, an issue, you know. If it serves a good purpose, you know, that's what litter bins are for, you know. And generally, if it's outside a bus stop where people get off the bus of yeah. uh, their waste, etc., if it meets the purpose, then it, it shouldn't be an issue to reinstall a bin. Um, but um, the bit I've picked up from what you're saying is that you know you're, you're doing your bit, dare I say that, and you're at litter picking. Um, we've also got um, a new system in place called Love Your Streets. And the Love Your Streets team, you, you can engage with them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it might be a group that want to do a local area, they do a litter pick. Um, I can send you the link for that because um, they can also supply your tools and equipment. So well, you I've, I've got the that. equipment from the, uh, the action group that I'm already in, so that's not a problem. But okay. I just think if... Um, well, the reply to the, you know, the request was there's no litter. And there's no letter because I'm picking it up. So yeah, if you could have yeah. a look at it, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, I'll look at the bin and I will okay. say thank you for keeping it clean for us. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. No thank problem. you. Thank, thank you, Margaret, for Thanks coming and raise, raising the question. Thank you, Les, for looking at it. If you can copy me in, Les, on the email, that would be uh, extremely helpful. Now, Ewan, I know, has had his hand up. Uh, he's got um, a question for you. So, uh, Ewan? No, Graham, thanks for coming along tonight, Les. The... Um, uh, I think it was a couple of things, really. First of all, on the, on the fly tipping, we've been liaising quite closely with Justin, but the, the lay-by on the A453 just going out towards Bassett's Pole there just before you get to the crematorium, um, there's an awful lot of industrial fly tipping going on down there because they can pull in quite, ni quite nicely on that lay-by. And what really concerns me about it is that, you know, sort of probably about 10, 15 years ago, um, I think uh, Carl Randall's in the call. He could probably explain the, the history of it, but the highways built that road up quite high. So the, when you there's a really steep verge, where, well, it's more, you know, sort of that valley really, that people can chuck it down, you can't see it. And I've, I had a look at it once to go and do it myself. And because of the steepness of that, I thought I'm not going down there because the number of times I've litter picked around there on roads off it, and you found needles and all these other things. And, and what concerns me is that, you know, we, the Sutton Coldfield Litter Action Group are going down there and they're, they're litter picking that. And, I, and, you know, on one hand, absolutely fantastic that they're doing it, but I'm really worried that if someone slips down that bank and then, you know, injures themselves and heaven knows what you find at the bottom of there sometimes. So I just really hope that, you know, if we can, I am speaking of highways sort of, um, where to try and get if we can get something resolved about the lay by, but I'm not really quite sure what the answer is other than probably prosecutions. And I think roughly I've had two prosecutions for fly tipping. But in the meantime, if, if we could just do our best to try and keep that clear and so that we don't have people potentially endangering themselves sort of going down there. And just the last thing I was going to say, the second thing, and if you could come back on that, would be brilliant. But it was just a really good news to hear the narrow wagons that you're getting there because with the more cars on the narrow roads, I have had some feedback from residents that, you know, some of the verges are taking a bit of a pounding because obviously the wagons have had to put two wheels on the verge. With some of the rain that we've had at the moment, of course, that mud just turns to a soup. So the soil in there, the grass just turns to a soup very quickly. So it's really good news to hear you've got some narrower wagons and give the verge a bit more protection. You know, so but thanks for that. Anyway, let's. Yeah. I will take the, the, what the, that label back to uh, Justin. I know he does a sterling job out there and uh, we're always looking to improve and get things better. But just just could you advise that, Councillor? Is it, is it 
truckers that are using it for dumping their waste down, you know, where they use bottles for toilets. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, there's a mixture. I mean, there's a, there is stuff that people just park up in the lay-by and chuck, chuck stuff out of sight, out of mind. I should imagine that there are people using that lay-by for, um, for other other reasons, shall we say. But the majority of stuff, when I look down there, that's black bags that have been chucked down there, and that's pretty much industrial fly tipping, if you ask me. Um, I've never gone through the waste, even though I've litter picked it myself a couple of times, you know. Um, but having said that, even when you do quite a bit of litter picking, you're never really quite sure why someone's chucked something away. And you see a number of things that happen to reoccur together. So what goes on to cause stuff? But but this is probably the majority of what I see there, I think, is uh, commercial fly tipping as opposed to just... Uh, I, I understand there is an issue in other laybys where... We, because of other facilities are closed, you've got truckers pulling in who've just got to empty their portal loose because they've got nowhere else to put them. But I, I don't believe this is the problem there. This is, I think it's just someone pulling up in a van in the dead of night quite easily, just, you know, one big heave and it's down the side of the bank and they're away, you know. But um, it's just, and I, I probably need some covert cameras really to try and resolve it, but sort of... Um, if you if they could have a close eye kept on that, just I just worry about members of the public litter picking it for the best of reasons, but just don't, obviously don't worry about injuries, you know. Yeah, we'll definitely do that, councillor. And um, what probably if, if what I do, I get just to do some screening of the bags. So if it is industrial, if it's a business doing it, we can get an address. We'll uh, if Mark Crockford is gone there, we'll speak to Mark and his team, and we'll look to do some proper action. I will say that we used to have a problem like this up on uh, Rigacre Road in Quinton, and it was around the bottle bank site, the old bank, bank, bottle bank sites, and we did a similar uh, exercise as that over there. And we called someone and found them. And we, took up a, uh, and we, we took up a big sign, basically. Local person uh, prosecuted for dumping. I think sometimes that can be the deterrence, and I think it's something we might look at again, that, you know, you're being watched. If we see you, you will be prosecuted. And sometimes that reminder before they do it might stop it. So let me venture into looking at something like that as well. If you could, because <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's, it might only be a two or three individuals that are doing this. If, yeah. It might be one, but I don't think it's my, I think it's just some people have got into it. It's an easy way of doing it. You know, the guy with a van gets 50 quid and of course yeah. he's not paying any money for, uh, you know, he just dumps it out of the back and it's easy money for him, you know, but it's just ruins everything for everyone else, doesn't it? Yes, yes. Let me look into it. I'll get Justin on the case, uh, my little yeah. blood end. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. Thank you, Les. Thanks, I, do, I do think, you know, if, if Springwatch can get cameras out to watch the wildlife, I'm sure we could get some cameras out, even if they were dummy cameras, um, which might be a deterrent to this because it's a bit like coat hangers, isn't it? You get one person dumping and the rest will follow suit. So feedback on that. Very welcome. Are there, I think there's another question. Um, pending, uh, and I think it might be from Margaret. So, Margaret, I can see a hand, hand up. Am I right? Yeah, I just, yes, thank you. I just wondered how much the fine was, Liz. Uh, they vary. The, some are fixed penalty fines, um, 70, 80 pounds. But if it's industrial dumping, it, le it leans to taking the van away and crushing it, court cases, uh, and it can run into many thousands of pounds. You oh, know. Okay. Okay. It's, Thank uh, you. It's Thank both you. Okay. The spectrum. The determinants of the money. Yes, Councillor, there's one more question from Jane Mosson. Okay, yes, I could see it. my screen saying one, one other. So, Jane, have you got a question for Les, please? Yeah, I do. Um, right, I, work, I live at Harvest Fields and I live in Combine Close, which is just a, a small um close of 18 properties and i've had a word with justin a few times because our uh waste gets collected on a tuesday and then the following week it's waste and recycling and more times than not the recycling isn't collected till either the wednesday or thursday and the problem is on this close, we only have pavement on one side of the road um, and it's only a short pa pavement. So when the bins go out on a Monday, 
and if it's recycling week as well, there's 36 bins out on a short piece of pavement. There's also 10 children um, live here. So the parents walk them to school in the morning. They have to walk in the road. And if we don't get the recycling collected on the Tuesday, the bins are still out through Tuesday and Wednesday. And wow. the kids have got to come back, walk down the road to get home. Yeah, apologies for that, Jane. Obviously, as you you are like you discussed it with Justin. Yeah. Um, let me let me see what's going on at the depot because I'm presuming if uh, although I've suggested we've got lots of our narrow track trucks now on refuse collection, oh. uh, but this is going to predate that. So if one truck can get in, I can't understand why the other one can't. So yeah. let me take it back and um, have a polite word with, with the crew that service yourselves, uh, and I'll get that put right and. Uh, give you the regular collection in place. Yeah, because um, we, we've had to start pulling our bins um, where the pavement is. There's no properties. Um, all the properties are sort of down at the end in a courtyard. Mm -hmm. We've had to pull our bins up onto the hill to get them collect collected anyway, because the trucks wouldn't come down, probably because of the cars being parked there. Um, they stopped collecting full stop at one stage. So that's why we had to start bringing our bins and putting them up the road. Let me, let me look into it, Jane. I'll get that sorted for sure. Okay. Um, just, okay. just uh, is it just yourself in combine or is it, um, is it anybody else on this no, stack? I think what's happening, they start at the other end of um, Harvey's Field. And when they get to ours, um, they run out of room. There's no more room in, on the truck. Mm. And I did suggest that maybe they could start at our end because everybody else can put their bin outside their property and yeah, they can yeah. put the truck out on the pavement. Yeah, I, I completely understand that, Jane. Uh, it's a no-brainer to me. It's not that we do it the wrong, the other way around. It's, if the truck's full, we tip the truck and we come out and finish the job. Leave yeah. that with me. I'll get that sorted. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, there's and I know that's an important issue. I'd almost wondering whether you get in a new vehicle called a combine harvester to pick up the recycling <laughs> from that from that. Well, that's road. probably but, what um, you used to get there boom, many years ago. Boom, boom, moving on, um, Ken Kennedy Close is a regular one that um, crops up. I know they've had the recycling eventually collected this week, and there's I do get regular complaints around Caversham Place. So. Um, are, are are these areas still on your hit list to try and sort of um, make sure they're regularly getting done? Uh, if we, uh, and I know Kennedy's not ringing any bells, but Caversham definitely is councillor. If we identify a problem and put a fix in, we expect the managers to monitor it for at least okay. four collection. So okay. Um, okay. Let, let me go check them back to the it's, depot. It's, well. it's Kennedy Close in particular um, that's the one that keeps raising its head all the time so it'll be done one week and the next week it might be mixed mixed or something like that do you know what i mean so it's uh, yes okay thank you are there any more questions yeah. okay are there any more questions for les no no yeah. more questions thank you very much les for coming along tonight and, and and sharing the good news and for all the work that your team's doing for us as well so lots of changes i know so thank you very much yeah, thanks for the invite, councillors, and I'll speak thank to you soon. Okay, yeah, thank thanks, you. Guys. Thanks. Um, moving on to highways, um, we've got Carl, and I think we've got Lucy and, Poss and Chris, is, I'm, I'm, I'm probably right. And I know we've got Heather Jones, uh, Sergeant Heather Jones, in the, in the background as well. Um, so, Carl, would you like to take the lead and just sort of give us an overview of what's happening currently? in roughly in trinity and what's happening over the next few months please and then um could lucy or chris follow carl and let us know about which roads are going to be resurfaced in the next few months as well and currently what can be done further to improve some of them where persistent potholes keep reappearing so um carl 
Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to your meeting. Um, very busy, as usual, in Sutton Trinity and roughly, uh, as well as the other uh, wards that we look after. There's always a high demand, highways related. Um, we're just finishing off some of the works in Trinity from last year. Uh, we, we completed the, the, the ballads and that's by uh, a bus stop by by Manny Corner. Uh, we did the no entry on the road at Caversham Place, but we, we we got stalled a little bit with a traffic regulation order. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to do one at King Edward Square, trying to allow the refuge to get into to, to the new flats that were built a few years ago. But we, we met with considerable objection there and we had to abandon that for now. Um, we, we carried on with Upper Clifton Road, where we were looking to install some double yellow lines on one side, about 22 metres, and a single yellow line on the other side, just to try and tidy up the parking as you go down Upper Clifton uh, uh, Road, down towards the roundabout at Park Road. We met with quite a mixed bag from residents, some with different ideas and agendas, and, and um, it was a real mixed bag. and and. We've had to try and navigate our way through, uh, met with some objection, but it was clear that every which way we turned, there was some objection. Um, we've now reported the objections uh, via a report to Cabinet member. Uh, they have been uh, considered and notwithstanding, we've been allowed to proceed. So hopefully very soon now we'll have those restrictions in place, which will complete some of the works from last year, unfortunately. We are um heavily involved in in different consultations for this year's works in trinity this year we're looking at uh, multiple sites for a traffic regulation order which is the legal mechanism by which we introduce yellow lines again not very straightforward uh trinity hill opposite mcdonald's at the uh, i think it's christadelphian hall and Sutton coalfield baptist church um, a lot of uber and other type drivers are parking either in breach of the existing restriction, a single yellow line, the double yellow lines um, by the church, or even the um, white zigzags of the pedestrian crossing. So we've been asked to look at what we can do there. It's a tricky one because the Christadelphian Hall and the Baptist Church have a need. And what we can't say is you guys, Uber, can't park there, but you guys can. So we've consulted extensively with the organisations and we believe as of as of yesterday, we've met with an agreement of what, what the businesses would be happy with. And we can now progress with a, a more formal consultation. Now we've teased out via an informal. Uh, I had a meeting today, um, I think we call it Unnamed Road, but it's a service road off Brassington Avenue that leads between Knight's House and United Reformed Church and the exit to uh, the Grace Church loading that Parker's taxis. Um, we've been asked to look at um, doing something there because now Knight's House is finished and beginning to be more and more occupied residents and others and the gym goers at the gym are parking there the gym's 24 hours and they're parking at times sometimes when it's legal after i think it's half six sometimes when it's not legal and it's causing an issue with a delivery uh sometimes heavy goods or double wagons a wagon with a trailer for instance sports direct it's causing an issue with them being able to exit following delivery and not being able to leave via the service road and having to unhook a trailer or drive over the grass and footway. So I had a meeting today with the Grace Church, with the United Reform Church, and we've come to uh, an amicable resolution that uh, suits those parties. Uh, they're the key for us, they're long established and with a, and with a need. Gym goers, you could argue, you know, heading to the gym, perhaps I could walk a bit further. They don't need to park. They don't need to make an illegal turn into the slip road and, and park as near as I can to the gym to then go and work out for an hour. So the priority was to get it right with the Grace Church and the United Reformed Church, and we have done. We'll now look to extend that consultation further, which will include Knight's House and the gym and others 
they may not be as, as, as happy, but our priority is to get it right for the area. Um, and then there's a, a small bit on um, on Tudor Hill, um, a particular particular little bit of illegal or obstructive parking, I should say, that with a, a minor alteration to the traffic regulation order, we can hopefully resolve that. So three three schemes, three lots of consultation, all a little bit tricky and different in their own right. Um, there's some other other things we're looking at as well. There's uh, some tactile paving needed on this unnamed road and perhaps a, a couple of bollards to stop people who um, either enter the slip road via Brassington Avenue via the curb and footway and down the drop curb or vice versa exiting Ill Ill illegally. Uh, so that, that's some of the other things, other things to look at. Um, Again, in Trinity, continuing to work with Royal Sutton Caulfield Town Council on some of the initiatives that they have. And I won't steal any of Mark's thunder, uh, but there's a few schemes there that uh, we are assisting and, and being a, a consultee and advising on um, that the Town Council wish to fund. But as it's our highway, if you like, we, we need to work together to, to get the best uh, result there. I appreciate the funding there, guys. Um, Anchorage Road was to be resurfaced. I don't want to steal any of Chris Richards' uh, information. Um, we we deferred that scheme, the resurfacing of it, because it, um, it, it's, it came about last time at the commencement of the town hall being used for the mass rollout of the vaccination uh, for COVID-19. Uh, and that's a very, very lengthy uh, vaccination rollout because you know it started with the 70 75 plus five year age brackets all the way down and by the time you got to you know my young age and, and others the you know the older people were due their second one so but i'm now being asked um to 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 see when that road can be resurfaced so i'm just making some inquiries i don't want to lose that road in the resurfacing program at the expense of a different road especially if it's a different one and not in southern coalfield so uh, just trying to establish when the vaccine rollout will subside enough uh naturally by way of everybody's being done such that we can uh, then look to get the road programmed back in for resurfacing. Just to say, um, Carly, in roughly war, there's plenty of roads that are willing to put themselves forward <laughs> and take the hardship of a resurfacing. And worthy council just... of pairs, you'll swap with you, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we've got some holes somewhere else we can fill. Yeah. Is that your route to work, council of pairs, by any chance? <laughs> we need that sure. smooth for you. Um, so yes, we, we continue to have Anchorage Road Pan Display Car Park free of charge for uh, people attending for a vaccine appointment. Uh, so that's continuing, but we, we, and, and um, we're still supporting the pedestrian crossing in its location. Um, uh, but obviously, once everything is at a significant level where it's manageable and we don't need the signals, we don't need the marshals. Uh, you know, we are keen to get the road resurfaced then. Um, what else are we doing? Um, okay, let's move into roughly. I don't want to miss roughly out. Um, Councillor Mackey, we met with yourself a week or so ago. We've got a few issues. Everything's Slade Road. I think Slade Road's a heart of roughly, isn't it? We've got so many issues on Slade Road. We're we're aware of some some abuse of the the grass verge, uh, shall we say? We know perhaps Kia contractors vehicles uh, have, have perhaps done a little bit of damage whether there was no choice but to you know bump over and go on the grass with other parked vehicles we know the refuge vehicle from what residents have said have, have gone over the grass we also know one or two local residents abuse the grass and park on it so we're, we're, we're drawing up plans now of what what we could do of options of perhaps having a, a meter or so overrun uh, and then putting some physical curbs to 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 stop this we're, we're looking at options and costs and and how far the money will go and what we could do uh and, and what you know residents may support um slide road is also giving us a headache brilliant that's kia are resurfacing the footways 
It's one of the biggest jobs I've seen in recent time, beaten only by the street lighting refresh of a, of a couple of years ago, where three mile of lights were replaced. Um, Kia have asked and I have granted an extension to the work till the 7th of September. There have been some delays and some issues. Um, I am aware that we've had complaints, significant complaints about uh, the lights being uh, temporary lights in place and the four way lights at Weeford, Harvest Field, Slade Road switched off on an individual four way operation for stages, which, which is obviously three times longer delay than normal and, and complaints that Kia aren't actually working there. Yeah. So I have written to the people in charge. I have had reassurance that they are going to you know, redouble the efforts and the supervision and ensure as best as possible um, that that people are working um, not at all times, but at all times when when there should be and it's it's practical to do so. That there were I some... if I could if I could just say you know really rub the salt in. You've got residents complaining about the inconvenience of the traffic lights. Um, obviously, some of them saying they'd be late for work, et cetera, and things like that. And then to be told, oh, by the way, they've just been granted an extension oh, for no. the length of time that's uh, going to be there. And it, it was almost as if like, I had to go back to the residents and say, OK, Kira's been told that they've got to work. They've got to use the lights. You know, when they put the lights up there, they've got to do the work. They can't leave yeah. it for days with nothing happening. But by the way, there's an extension just going on the back of that as well. <laughs> yes. most people, it's double edged. What, what I've asked for and what's been agreed is for, for, for care management to to make sure this is being supervised because ultimately there'll be some subcontractors being used. So we need to make sure that they're on top of this. Um, they are working during the day when they should be working. We, we don't want lights switched off and, you know, in, in independent one one stage at a time if, if, if things people aren't working there. Uh, I've asked for a review of, of the traffic signal operation. I've asked for that today uh, to see, does it need four individual arms? Um, does it need Weeford coned off at the moment? Can they operate on Weeford harvest fields as one and Slade as, as, as two separate? So I've asked for it to be reviewed, asked for, it for some closer supervision. I mean, great that all that length of footway is being done. That, that is, you know, it must be costing a fortune. It's a tremendous length and, you know, great to have some work being done in the ward. But, you know, we need to make sure, you know, it's being done to an optimum and not not a hospital job, not being dropped on now and again. Because if residents see that regularly, you know, OK, you know, the guys can go back for materials that can hit a problem. They, they did hit a problem the other day. There, there was a fault detect, detected on the lights. Things that I didn't know about and you didn't know about. And so to the general public, it's, it's very frustrating. But we need to just keep on top of it. So uh, that's two things for Slade Road. Third thing for Slade Road, having complaints about speed, uh, as, as, as usual, you, you come through from Carraway Head, from Staffordshire, from London Road, and it's 60 mile an hour. You come to number 258, first house, and it's 30 mile an hour. And that's where the Terminal 30 signs are, where it begins. We do know that people haven't adjusted the speed accordingly. Hence why we arranged for the flashing speed sign to go there initially a couple of years ago. Uh, or so and then that developed the fault of all faults uh, and so we had to get it swapped uh, to another one. I, I was advised that 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 had failed as well this week uh, and I, I did write to get it checked but I came through today and it was working so whether our guys have fixed it you know super fast or or whether in fact it, it was working and, and it was sort of misreported um, but we are still having complaints and I know we have police colleagues on, on the uh, on, at the meeting and I have advised a particular resident that if they can get in touch with the police as well, that there's a limit to what we can do and what measures we can put in place. But I suggested that perhaps this resident might be interested in contacting the police, attending a, uh, a community speed watch uh, initiative. I have been there with the police in the past community speed watch and on pro laser so i know it's a site that the police do this 
uh, and that during COVID these types of operations uh, quite obviously didn't take place and couldn't because of you know we need a, a few people to be there close proximity working together but perhaps now this can take place again uh, and if the resident has those concerns then you know please help us and get involved and, and be a person there assisting. So awful lot of uh, Slade Road issues. Um, the last thing I'll mention is a Tamworth Road lay-by. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Les, Les is still with us. Um, Justin is, is aware, uh, well aware of, of the issues and, and is working with us on getting the material removed as and when. Uh, it is very frustrating. Um, I do think cameras, covert or over, probably over, would be a good idea. Um, we've explored the option of extinguishing the lay-by, but that's a difficult one. Is that the right thing to do? It, it has a lot of genuine usage every day, all day, every day. What that usage is, I don't know. I haven't surveyed or questioned people, but there's always somebody parked there, whether it's people walking the dog, laying over waiting for a particular slot with a funeral and that type of thing or whether people know it's there and and have a rest before continuing the journey i don't know uh and i do fear there could be a considerable considerable backlash if we extinguish the lay by a considerable expense far exceeding your annual budget councillor mackey um you know and then people will come out and you know why didn't you tackle the problem what 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 you know they could still pull up on the grass, those who've done it previously, and still tip. Just because it's curbed through and not a lay-by, people tip on the grass or from the grass now. So the, the fencing has, has been raised as, uh, as an option as well. It's rare, it's unusual. Uh, highways very, very rarely install fencing. People normally fence off their land from the highway. We don't fence off the highway from other people's land. This I know is a slightly different situation. When the M6 toll came through, early 2000s, late 90s, um, the road was raised uh, to form you know, the bridge as it is now over. Um, so it, it is an option going forward, but as was discussed earlier, perhaps a camera uh, and some signage uh, from, from uh, waste management colleagues is, is an idea. As I say, we have a number of priorities in Roughly Ward, as, as, as you're well aware, that we're looking at, and, and we simply can't fund all of them. Uh, and this one measure of load alone far exceeds your allocation. So it's it's a difficult one. Um, that's a very quick whistle stop tour on the two okay. wards. I'm happy could to I take just, questions. Um, thank you. Just a just, quick one, if I, I, if I could there on Carl, is just that, I mean, obviously you mentioned the verge there on Slade Road and I've consulted on that and I think I've got the replies back on that. So I haven't seen them yet, but I'll share them with you. The, the lay by itself, um, I'm in the process of consulting on that. And so when I get everything back in, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know and feed okay. those back through to you. Um, the, I was going to ask if you, if you had any, if you'd heard anything back, I mean, I think technically it's in Mere Green Ward, but that little spot of green on Heathcroft Croft Road, uh, the residents of, um, of Roughly Ward would probably declare that's pretty much as theirs, as much as it is Mere Green Ward. But the, that hole was dug. Yeah. yeah, that hole was dug the other day. Obviously, in January, uh, myself and Councillor Jenkins put uh, represented the residents is probably the best way to put it to say that they weren't keen on a 5G mass. The proposal from um, Hutchison 3 uh, UK, I think they are, uh, or 3 as they're normally known, um, that was refused. Now, this looks like it might be different people, but the hole's been dug there. They've helpfully put a note on saying asbestos and then just put a tarpaulin over it. Um, I was just wondering if you'd come across any information as to what may be going on there, and and can they just dig a hole like that and then just put a tarpaulin over it, saying asbestos? Should they not okay. have filled it back in again and then waited for specialist people to come? I mean, I'm not quite sure how that fits legally to just leave a mm -hmm. hole with asbestos marked on it. Yes, I can update you a little further. Um, uh, out and about at uh, meetings today, but catching up on my emails this evening, um, when I had the inquiry from yourself, it, you're right, it's just in Mere Green, Greenwood, but, you know, for, for the sake of yards. Um, 
I did investigate it. I went out myself. I took some photographs. Uh, it's T-Mobile that have um, they've done the excavation and their contractors. Um, I inquired with our with Birmingham City Council specified licenses team. I gave them the the reference number that was on the uh, paperwork. Um, it wasn't an application through them. Um, they wrote to Kia to Streetworks, and Kia Streetworks wrote back to me this afternoon. And yes, T-Mobile have applied through Kia and were granted consent for the excavation of that uh, uh, that hole in the grass verge on Heathcroft Road Junction. Um, the wording was it's something like for, um, it's basically uh, a hole to look for you any utility apparatus. It's it's a scoping exercise. It's can we dig a hole to see what's underground? And they were given permission to do that. So it's not for a mast or apparatus or foundation. It could be to follow, but initially it's an excavation to look to see what is what else may be underground. So gas, water, cable, BT, uh, fibre, uh, you know, you name it, what could be underground. So they've done the excavation. Uh, they've had a shock and came, you know, come across asbestos and whatever. I don't know the legal on that. If you disturb asbestos, then yes, you have to call out a specialist company. Disturbed asbestos is what can be lethal. Um, hence why I think they probably wasn't allowed to just fill the hole in. Uh, they've covered it up. It's buried off. There's a, a notice, albeit handwritten, to warn. Um, and, and that's where we're at. Um, Kia Streetworks have given permission for the excavation. What I don't know is but we can possibly guess, uh, you know, whether there'll be a, a future application for the actual mast apparatus or, or whatever, albeit maybe not at that exact location. You know, it may be that they need to move a few metres to avoid whatever they've, they've come across. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Kai. You could imagine that, first of all, a hole appears in an area that obviously had they had an application for 5G mast. Then I have to go back to residents to say, look, you know, at this stage, we know absolutely nothing about it. Then the next day, a sign goes up to say asbestos again. It's just like another one of those, just rubs the salt in the residents' yeah. rooms. It? And, and to be fair, I'm furious about it myself, really. If You know, to just leave a sign like that is almost quite taunting. So, I mean, you know, what can we do as councillors? I mean, councillors Jenkins and I are going to start consulting next week because that's what you would expect us to do. And so yeah. we will be ready for whatever comes out of that. But sort of... Um, I, I just feel it would have been so much more professional of them to let us know what they were doing and then yes. try and get the residents on side rather than just to go ahead and do that and then just leave a hole in what is a beautiful green. The residents absolutely love it. And they just feel it's been scarred and there's a big sign there saying asbestos and then just disappear off. No, no one yes. tells anyone anything. And I'm really, really angry about it. And, and, and the residents are yeah. rightly so, you know. It's not your fault. I'm just, you know, uh, I'm just, uh, just uh, understandable. And and looking at some of the apparatus that they put in, it tends to be a twenty meter monopole. And looking at those trees and the canopies, you know, that they haven't got that kind of height at that location. Um, yeah. So it could interfere with the trees. So I'll, I'll go back to Kia Streetworks and ask, you know, what is going to happen because they've they've, they've put an application in which was approved I believe it was only for I think it was a 25th to 27th it was only two or three days work clearly that has expired I know why and I can understand why but I, I still need to know you know what what will happen what what's the next step so I need to liaise with Kia Street Works to, to to try and see what what the next steps are um, whether they have to get the asbestos treated, removed or made safe. I don't know if it's part of underground apparatus or they uncovered some historic dumped stuff. I, I really don't know what it means and I'm not going to move the tarpaul into have a look. No, no, I don't blame you. I mean, I, I shouldn't mention other companies, but, you know, Virgin have been so good at whenever they're doing anything, they come and let us know what they're doing, come and talk to us about it. We might not always agree with it, but at least we know what's going on. Yes. Where T-Mobile have just turned up here and done this and, and they're just going to make it really difficult for themselves from here on in, I reckon. Yes. I'm just wondering if it's worth Kia coming in at this this point, um, 
So, Keir, are you able to comment on this and just give us a quick update on your activities and then we can take a few questions because I know the time is moving on a little bit now. Um, I that Streetworks is a different department to me in the sense that um, Carl, please liaise with me if, if you need anything from me with regards to I'm, I'm, I'm highways inspections and carriageways and street furniture. As far as street works, it is a different department, but I can take any concerns that have been raised by this. It's totally new to me in that regard. I, I hadn't been, I wasn't aware of it. But Carl, if you do need me, I'm here. Let me know. Thank you very much, Chris. To, to be fair to Chris, um, councillors, I wrote to BCC's specified licensing team thinking that's where it would go. They wrote to Kia. And when I got back this evening, that's the first I learned that it was a Kia street work. So Chris wouldn't have known. Okay, so, thank you. So, Chris, can we um, just uh, bring you in and then take any quick questions uh, after that? Do you want to just share with us from Kia point of view? Any yeah, good um, news that we're going to see over the next few months on road surfacing and activities? Yes, very much so. There is a, a, a it went to full board council meeting because obviously Kia work under um, permission from BCC to undertake resurfacing works. We did a proposal and a, a, a request for roads in the whole network, but as well as Roughly and Trinity. That doesn't mean that anything that we're doing is on hold. We're still doing the monthly drivens that started today in your wards, and we've got walks inspections starting on Monday. A driven inspection is looking for safety critical defects that are ultimately safety critical, life threatening, for want of a better word, or a better couple of words. Um, safety inspections, walk safety inspections are more safety critical in the sense that it's on ground level. Um, it, and and it's inspectors can see footway hazards and carriageway hazards. Driven inspections are only looking at the carriageway. Um, they are going ahead. The programme, as it stands at the moment, after having agreement from the City Council, uh, is being fine tuned. Uh, and I will, I've made notes actually while we've been having the conversations. Uh, I've made notes to say. What can we find out for roughly and Trinity, your wards, with regards to actually um, uh, see what roads are programmed and the dates uh, and months that we're actually going to undertake uh, the, the works that you need? OK, thank you. Um, are there any questions for uh, Chris and Carl before we move on to the next item? I can see a hesitant yeah. here and there. Hello. Well, yeah, I was just thought I'd try and jump in. But yeah, I mean, just uh, thanks very much for helping me out on uh, Grange Lane today on the drainage uh, section there. Was, thank you for, for stepping in, because I appreciate it. not everyone knows where those, those drainage um, ducts are, so to speak. But I do feel that the, the most amount of feedback I'm getting is, first of all, those, those old concrete roads um round about the sort of you know the row allen road uh homer road essex road where that tarmac's peeling off and i'm no i'm no civils engineer but i'm beginning to learn that tarmac pulled, pulled on top of concrete is is a is a is not a mix that most people would recommend and it's peeling off there and the residents there just don't like because there's there's you know repairs to repairs are now being exposed along there so if that could be done in and I'm getting lots of requests from what I would consider that if you consider harvest fields and then all those roads that were the original houses that now um, envelop Harvard, your know, Marpit Lanes, your Wilmot Roads, yeah. your Worcester Roads, your Grange Lanes, a lot of people there complaining about their footway. They're feeling that it hasn't really been touched in the last sort of 30, 40 years or so. And and whilst they're overjoyed to see Slade Road getting resurfaced and the and the other roads being redone, they're they're quite rightly saying, well, what about my footway? Because you know, 
residents are complaining about tripping and falling on the uneven surfaces. And um, I appreciate that you have your criteria and you will always go and repair anything that doesn't, that is considered to be a trip hazard. But obviously they have pride in their area and they would just like to see these footways nicely smoothed out. So if any time you could work them into the programme, certainly sort of um, sort of this year would be really appreciated by me and the residents if you could there could yeah absolutely i could put that i could put those proposals forward and then obviously they'll go to you to your full full board meetings for um consideration from consideration from yourselves um that can be done no problem at all okay. once inspections are being undertaken there are criteria that are changing where normally we we would have um a six month repair work order we're actually looking at getting that um we had what we called a safety inspection strategy and we actually said that some of the criteria that we've the new criteria that we're actually working on for once a better statement don't actually take into consideration where inspectors can see it's not cat one or life-threatening it's not high level um deterioration to the sense that somebody could actually really seriously injure themselves on a footway but there is still scope where we shouldn't where we should be doing at least an interim measure and booking it maybe a little bit further out so that it can actually we could identify that there is a defect there it's only going to get worse why wait six months let's get it onto the system so what what why wait six months for the next walks inspection so that we can get it actually done with and dealt with okay thank Great. you very much chris i can't see any resident hands up so i'll just say to be a little certain line recurring potholes on the section from the railway bridge to Litchfield Road, I think fits the bill of what you've just said about footpaths, constantly problems. So an update on that would be really good. So thank you both for your attendance tonight. Thank and, you very uh, much. Oh, if I could say that was always okay. ex-count or Alderman Waddington, that was always her big one, wasn't it? She that bit on Little Sutton Lane just well, on I, the bridge I, there. I, I, I thought that was Waddington Park that you were just talking about with the hole, but that's another story. <laughs> um, let's move on to um, um, town council matters because uh, this first opportunity, really, we've had an officer come to this meeting, which we want to be a, really a joint meeting between Birmingham and Sutton, working together for all the residents um, to see that we can do the best we possibly can. And uh, I know that Mark's got some good news to share with us. Um, uh, so, Mark, uh, do you just want to uh, take us through a quick brief run through of some good news from the town council and um, some things that we might be hearing about over the coming months um, going forward on the key issues that uh, residents are really interested in across the town? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, for those people that don't know me, I'm Mark Dixon, Senior and Delivery. Sorry to interrupt you, Mark. You're very quietly coming out. I don't know if everyone else can hear you well. Uh, it's my microphone that uh, sometimes Thank I you. take it by surprise. And uh, is that better? It, it's very quiet. Yeah, let me um, just let me see if I can do anything with it. Bear with me, Mark. Fortunately, it's on automatic. So uh, if I uh, if I lean in, is that any better? That's yeah, a lot better. That's better. Yeah, uh, yeah. Po apologies for uh, leering in. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm um, Mark Dixon, Senior Program Delivery Manager of the Town Council. So um, I'm going to talk to you first about the uh, Town Ranger Service. So uh, Royal Sutton Coalfield Town Council launched its Sutton Coalfield Town Ranger Service in the middle of November last year. So it's been in operation for around about seven months so far. Uh, this um, new clean and green service operates right away across the town. And it's in addition to services already provided by Birmingham City Council. And basically it's designed to keep the, uh, the Royal Town clean, litter free and well maintained. And the service targets those work <coughs> no longer provided by Birmingham City Council due to budget constraints. So it includes general cleaning, um, sweeping, litter picking, 
removing graffiti and at the moment cutting back a lot of overgrown vegetation that's around the town. So the service is actually contracted out to Adverdi and it's provided by um, a highly skilled and dedicated team of four operatives and in support of the town council's strategic priority to provide a sustainable future for the town the range of service um, uses environmentally friendly electric vehicles and battery powered handheld machinery for that so what have they done to date um, so far they've worked on 150 locations around the town um, some of these are one-off jobs um, but others are now part of a uh, a regular uh, round of maintenance and of that 150 around 20 are in roughly and 30 are in trinity ward and examples of the jobs tackled in your two wards include um well first off a thorough tidying of the five town center car parks so they started in november and that was uh, if you remember when we were in lockdown so the car parks were absolutely empty so they uh, had free reign to uh, to uh, give them a thorough uh, tidying. Um, they've tidied the alleyway between Marpit Lane and Worcester Lane, and there are more alleyways in Sutton Coalfield than I ever imagined existed in any town in the country, but uh, we've cleaned, I think, the majority of them, but they keep uh, popping up. Um, cutting back overgrown hedges, uh, a recent job, I think last week, uh, on Little Sutton Lane by the Fox and Dogs, the hedges were overhanging the fence and people couldn't safely pass there. Um, they've litter picked the streets around Plantsbrook School. Uh, the team have visited Harvest Fields. Uh, they've done some litter picking and tidying in that area around the front of the centre, but they've also worked at the back on Dutton Lane, Dutton's Lane to get rid of litter picking uh, litter there. And they've also repaired a couple of break, broken fences in the gate, which potentially could have allowed children to um, to get out onto the road. Uh, they tidied the verges by the cinema, cut back on the epicormic growth around the trees and tied to the bushes there. And they made sure that the car parks in King Edward Square were clean, safe and tidy for the thousands of residents who visited the vaccination centre at the town hall since January. They've also helped with litter picks. Um, we've mentioned uh, Sutton Coalfield Litter Action Group, which is supported by the Town Council. But occasionally the um, the the activities that the, the group they're involved with, it's a bit more than just residents litter picking. And certainly if there's fly tipping, which is just outside the City Council's area of operation, where it's say in Farmers Gates, which is private land, they've been able to help with that and bring the, the litter onto the pavements so that it can be collected by uh, Justin's teams. So um, it's say seven, seven and a bit months and it's been a great success. They've provided a very fast, efficient and high quality service across the town. Importantly, that makes a difference to where people live. Um, we've had quite a lot of unsolicited feedback. Uh, people stop and speak to the rangers themselves. I know councillors, you get um, responses from uh, from residents as well and on social media um, everybody seems to be very pleased with what we're delivering it's all been overwhelmingly positive so from the town council's point of view the um, there are additional benefits of the service uh, we've got greater visibility of the town council through the branding of the personnel and the vehicles and engagement with the council is increasing as well because I do a twice weekly um, update on social media and every time I always ask for residents if they've got proposals for grot spots to contact the local town council and then it feeds back through to me. Uh, and I'm rattling through quickly. So uh, finally, another couple of ward uh, related uh, items. As you know, the town council replaced the bins at harvest fields but I'm now looking to revamp the beds, uh, the, the very tired planting around the beds at the front of the centre. Uh, that will be done this autumn. And you'll have seen the, the wildflowers that are now starting to sprout up. That is going to look spectacular in about three or four weeks, um, assuming the rain and sunshine keep, uh, keep uh, on. Um, and 
Trinity, uh, new benches and better greenery for the parade and lower parade now is uh, is due next month. They are being manufactured as we speak. And again, these are very visible improvements that we're making for the benefits for the benefit of residents and visitors to the town. So that was a, a very quick run through. Thank uh, you. Yeah, that's what questions? that's what we the mark. That's what we needed a quick run through. There will be some questions in a minute. Yep. Um, because I know I've seen two hands up already. There's two big issues though that residents will want to know what the town council will be doing. Um, so for the next meeting, yep. um, yes. if we could have an update at the next meeting on the town centre regeneration and what's happening there, yep. and at Sutton Park and the, what the consultants have done there. I know there are all sorts of issues around those two subjects, but yep. they're two very big subjects. Um, that people are interested in. Yeah. Um, and I know that everyone is very grateful to all the hard work that the town rangers have been doing. Now I can see Margaret and Ewan have got their hands up. So Margaret, do you want to come in? Thank you. So first of all, I just wanted to say well done because the town rangers are doing a brilliant, brilliant job. And I know I keep harping on about the Sutton Goldfield Dutch and Litter Group, but every day there's something about the town rangers. So I just wanted to say thank you, really. Thank you. I'll pass it, I'll pass it on to the team. They're yeah, great. they're doing a grand job. And I met uh, some of the guys, you know, randomly on a walk, and they were chopping all the grass and sorting out the, bed, uh, the vegetation. And just thank you. Doing a great, great job. Brilliant. Love you. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Ewan? Yeah, I, I was going to say something similar, but I think Margaret said it a lot better than me. I, I think that the one thing I like about it, and there's many things I like about it, it's it's a positive, it's such positivity. It sort of sometimes, yeah, getting things done sometimes, I don't want to harp on, but sometimes trying to get things done from some of the, uh, systems there in Birmingham City Council you know you've got to really push and push and this is just such a lovely thing where you, you ask the Rangers to go and do something and sort of um, you know I, I can ask late one evening for something to be done and they're there in the afternoon there's photographs saying it's been done do you want us to do anything else and it's a really positive thing so just, just thanks very much for everything you're doing with that really. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark, uh, for coming tonight um, and for sharing all the good news and um, for what you're doing, helping to manage the Rangers as well, and et cetera, et cetera. So thank you. Um, moving on then to Heather. Heather, you've been waiting patiently in the wings there. Um, is there any update for us on anything, and in particular about the speeding issue that was brought up at the previous meeting around the back of the Odin or the Empire, the Empire as it's now called? Yes, um, in relation, hello everybody, um, in relation to the speed in there, we've done um, four community speed watches um, throughout May and June. Relatively low amounts of people that are actually exceeding that limit, I would say probably three to four people, um, which is obviously we were expecting quite a few more. We've changed the times of day, uh, you know, we've done some on the evenings, some in rush hour, some in the mornings, um, but again, similar results. Um, just to run through some of the sort of last month's crimes, crime figures for you, um, relatively low. We've um, robberies in Sutton Coalfield. I've got some figures for the whole of Sutton, which is all four wards, not just Trinity. So there's been four robberies within the last month, but only one of those has been on Trinity Ward. Um, burglaries, there's been 12 across the whole of the four wards. Three of those are on Trinity. We have picked up on a um, some similarities in the MOs of those burglaries. And in particular, five of them have been in the last seven days. Now, obviously, I'm not going to speak tactically about what we're doing about that, um, but we do have offenders that are currently being targeted. Um, a lot of them, most of these, even though three have only been on Trinity, the majority are on the Four Oaks border with Staffordshire. Um, so we'll be doing joint work with Staff's police on that to target those offenders. 
Um, and then finally, vehicle crime. There's been 19 vehicle crimes, but no specific patterns. And that includes, uh, you know, theft from motor vehicles as well as um, theft of. I thought I'd bring some figures from Erdington as well, which is obviously our neighbouring police and constituency, just so that you can have a bit of a comparison on the crime figures for certain. So the total recorded crime, that's all crime reported to the police from Sutton Coalfield uh, this month to date is 259 crimes, whereas Erdington, that figure is 813 crimes. Um, and to break those down into our key crimes, so the vehicle crime in Erdington has been 48 in comparison with 19 at Sutton. Burglaries in Erdington has been 25 burglaries in comparison with 12 in Sutton, obviously just the three in Trinity. Um, and then vehicle crime, uh, 48. I think I've already said that one. We've still got very high figures uh, increase in domestic violence at the moment. So um, domestic violence remains one of our policing priorities at the moment. Uh, there's been a massive increase in domestic violence related reports and incidents since the lockdown. Uh, we can only put that to the fact that people are working from home, people are that normally, um, you know, off out and about doing separate businesses. And so if they're all in the same residential homes together um, and we've seen a massive spike. So, again, that, that remains a priority um, for, the, for the force as well as, as our local neighbourhood. Um, other priorities within Sutton um, are Op Hercules. So this is the antisocial driving matters. And I think we touched on this as well last meeting. So there's been a big injection of um, cash and overtime into that Op Hercules. I know that they've been very, very active recently and a lot of our neighbourhood officers as well have been doing um, overtime on that, trying to tackle the unsocial driving, particularly around like the Bassett's Pole I-38 areas. I haven't got exact numbers, but I know that there's been a large number of um, drivers that have been issued with the Section 59 uh, notices. Uh, any further sort of unsocial driving from them will result in their cars being seized. Um, that's on Twitter. So if anybody wanted to follow what was happening on Op Hercules and a lot of the positive results, um, if you're on Twitter, if you look at um, WMP traffic or uh, hashtag Op Hercules, you'll be able to see a lot of the updates that go on there. Um, just in relation to that Twitter, um, we also put not all of our speed watches because um, a lot of our officers and PCSOs now we are coming back out of the lockdown are picking back up on a lot of their community speed watches. We're doing them sort of virtually every single day. There's, there's a number of speed watches going on all around Sutton. So they're not all on there, but quite a lot of them will be posted on Twitter. So if people wanted to see, you know, we would recommend. I mean, our Twitter group is Sutton Coalfield Police. So if you wanted to follow that at all on Twitter, that will give you a bit of um you know, a bit more information of what we're doing more on a day to day basis. Obviously, this meeting is, you know, you know, you'll get a lot more about what we're doing um, if you do have access to that Twitter. Um, under 25 public place violence also remains um, a priority for us uh, and weapons. So um, there's uh, an operation, op Operation Guardian, um, where we look at public place violence in under 25s. Uh, there's been an awful lot of work that have, that's been carried out on that, uh, particularly in Sutton Town Centre. Um, and we've done a lot of work in conjunction with other forces as well. So I know the Sutton Open team have put an awful lot of time in doing lots of patrols um, in and around the Sutton Town Centre, lots of weapon sweeps, um, lots of engagement with schools, knife arches in schools. Um, and we've been targeting a specific group um, that have been causing lots of antisocial behaviour in the town. Um, because of all the activity that's been done by the neighbourhood team, that's displaced a lot of that um, behaviour um, and it's gone onto the train lines and we've seen the, the group of offenders that we've had in Sutton Town Centre have been offending, um, going up and down on the train lines and going into onto Staffs and West Mercy. So they've been going into Litchfield. Um, there's been a number of arrests in Litchfield. So we've been doing lots of um, joint forces. So on some of the operations, we've run probably uh, since the last meeting about five um, quite large scale operations involving uh, Staffordshire Police, West Midlands Police, West Mercia Police, 
um, and British Transport Police and our cipher tra travel teams. So we've done a lot of joint operations. That's both plain clothes um, and uniform, it's really targeting that train line um, and all those towns and areas off that train line, all, all you know, in conjunction and, and targeting the sound offenders. So that's a bit more of some of the work that we've been doing as well. OK, thank you, Heather. And I can hear your own Twitter feed in the background. Yes, yeah, so and no wonder there's a lot of activity. Um, I think, I think Councillor Mackey's got a quick question for you. Yeah. Well, uh, I was going to say that um, I think it's a blackbird that's singing in the back there, isn't it? I'm no, uh, and uh, I tell you what, it's um, probably the most calming um, uh, delivery of anything I've received so far this evening. So thank you for that alone. Um, I mean, uh, I had, while you were mentioning that, I did double check the Twitter feeds. I'm glad to report I am following a Sutton Coalfield police. Lovely. So, um, you know, so yeah, very useful it, it is too. Um, just on the Operation Hercules, um, I have heard actually positive feedback um, from residents that, you know, I had a lot of complaints about the, I think I think one of that time I popped down to the uh, station and we had a chat I, met, I raised it with you about the site that it just basically the noise of the racing engines that was heard and the concern that residents had that you know w was it even safe to be going out when these cars are going round and about and I have had positive feedback from them that touch wood they said they don't know what's happened but it seems to have quietened off so they have yeah. seen the benefit of the work that's been done there and I appreciate that it's a bit like herding cats, isn't it? You know, you sort one bit out and then it pops up somewhere else. But just to give you some positive feedback that the residents have appreciated the work. Well, they do what they appreciate all the work the police do, but on that area there, they're really appreciative that it's not um it's it's not sort of flaring up like it once had, but I've mentioned it now, so I'll get ready for an email full of things that have, <laughs> <laughs> that have cropped up. But, but I just thought I'd give you some positive feedback because obviously yeah, I'm yeah. straight up whenever it's something I don't like. So I thought I'd let you know that that's perfect. So thanks very much for that. No okay. Problem. Thank you. Thank you. I can't see any other questions. So thank you very much. And thanks, Heather, for your patience there being the last uh, one on tonight. We'll try and bring you on a nearer the start um, <laughs> next time. So, so thank you very much. Um, before I close the meeting, um, is there any other business that hasn't been notified already? No? no. Um, we the next meeting. The next meeting then, if everyone is happy with that, is the 16th of September. Um, so Heather, if you're able to come to that one, and Mark, if an officer can come from the town council, that would be extremely helpful. Ewan, is there anyone else that you would like to see at that meeting? Uh, I think that so sort of someone from Parks, I think I've had a lot of feedback regarding the cutting of the verges, et cetera. And obviously by September, that may well be an issue that no one's interested in. But I, I think that it's always useful to have Parks here to discuss that. And if I can, if I could just congratulate Mark on his debut, if you don't mind, his first time out. And mm -hmm. so thanks very much for that. And um, I look forward to sort of hopefully see him next time. And again, I just want to say thank you, Heather, for being so patient. The meeting's gone on for a long time. You've sat there and you've overcome your technical issues at the beginning. So congratulations to that as well. Yeah, congratulations. Okay. We didn't have a four-year-old popping into the meeting as well. <laughs> She's managed to... Uh, <laughs> That's all right. Good. We, we don't know how old the residents are that join our meeting. So thank you very much <laughs> indeed for all your attention tonight. Thank you, Leslie, for sorting everything for us. So good night. See you on the 16th. Cheers, thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.